I'm going to start without you, Marianne. So. Okay. I think Joe was trying to get in as well. He had to reboot his computer. Okay. All right. It is 6.02, and I am going to call the meeting of the Shelby Regional High School Building Committee to order. Uh, the first order of business, I just want to announce, noticing Recording that, in progress. Um, thank you, uh, Ms. Masterson. Uh, I just wanted to announce for everyone's uh, information this evening, I see that Bolton Access is here. So apparently this is being recorded for, uh, we're being broadcast on Bolton Access this evening. Um, first order of business, public comment. Um, there are quite a few people here this evening. So if you are here for public comment or you wish to be heard on public comment, could you simply raise your golden hand or let me know? I'll just scan through the uh, attendees here quickly. Okay, I'm not seeing anyone here for public comment. So I will proceed with the agenda and I will call for a motion for the approval of the draft meeting minutes of May 17th, 2023. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Sikansky. Do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Ms. Viverito. Uh, is there any discussion on the minutes? I'm not seeing any. Uh, see, I just want to compliment you. Your minutes are becoming superb and more superb every time you submit them. So, all right. With that in mind, let me call the roll. Ms. Viverito? Yes. Ms. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Buck? Yes. Mr. Skansky? Yes. Uh, Ms. Dupuy? Yes. Ms. Early? Yes. Thank you, Kim. Mr. Fromer? Yes. Ms. Kendall is going to be a little bit late. Uh, Mr. Nicholson? Yes. Ms. Rich? Yes. Thank you, Tanya. And Mr. Yesway? Yay. Superintendent Downing? Yes. And myself, yes. That is unanimous. Okay. Uh, the next item on the agenda is just an announcement of a communication we received from um, Select Board Member Sturgis of the Stowe Select Board. Uh, that was made part of the meeting minutes. I hope you've had an all have an audit, all had an opportunity to review uh, Select Board Member Sturgis's communication. Joe, a uh, very quick correction: um, Ellen Sturgis is no longer a Select Board member. Oh, I'm sorry. That's former okay. Select Board member. Thank you, Ms. Viverito. Former Select Board member um, Ellen Sturgis. So, um, thank you for that correction. Um, in regards to this communication, I just want the um, building committee to know that uh, there were at least three responses that were sent out to uh, former select board Sturgis's uh, email. One of them came from uh, Ms. Viverito and her capacity as a Stowe representative to this committee, as well as her, in her capacity as chair of the uh, district committee. Uh, there were two additional communications uh, sent out in response to this. And I bring this up because I, I wanted to uh, read into the record of these proceedings a portion of uh, one of the responses that was sent in regards to uh, questions regarding the pre-K uh, learning areas that are part of the proposed schematic design. And unless there's an objection from Superintendent Downing, as he is the author of this portion of the response, I'd like to read that into the record. So Kirk, if without any objection, uh, I'd like to read what uh, you had submitted and partial response to what had been received by this committee. Uh, in no. regard, uh, thank you, Kirk. Uh, in regards to your question regarding the pre-K dedicated learning spaces and the proposed new high school, please note that the two pre-K classrooms are included because the Neshoba Regional School District here and after, excuse me, uh, here and after district currently carries a wait list for this preschool programs. In addition, the district will need to accommodate required preschool programs for students with special needs. Information attended here too was brought forward during the visioning process and was included in the educational plan that was crafted with the input from educators, residents, and students. Building these spaces ensures the district will be able to meet future requirements for all students ages three to five. 
The benefit of having a preschool program at the high school is the district will be able to offer an integrated child development course for the high school students. This child development course will offer students an opportunity to grow skills that are applicable in their daily lives, as well as build the competencies outlined in our portrait of Neshoba graduate. It is not a vocational program and will be incorporated into the health and wellness program at the high school. In addition to that, I'd also like to recognize a uh, contribution from Joseph Milani from Kessel Booz and Associates, Inc., who had um, sent some uh, information regarding the costs attendant to this preschool area. I'm not going to read what Mr. Milani said verbatim, simply to highlight a portion of what he said and that he spoke about the fact that these preschool areas that are part of the schematic design will include early intervention room or in early intervention learning areas and a preschool occupational therapy physical therapy, and speech therapy rooms. Um, I felt that that was important to at least read into the record in regards to what it is that we're uh, doing in respect to that portion of the design. So with that in mind, I will move the agenda to the report from our OPM. Ms. Williams, Ms. Swin, take it away. Okay, so I'll be presenting the report tonight. Um, over the last couple of weeks, actually, it was only two weeks since our last meeting, so it's a, a briefer report, but we have been working on updating the information for the schematic design submission. Included in that, we've been uh, meeting with the working group and educational leadership uh, to review the DESE, which is uh, Department of Elementary Secondary Education submission, and um, uh, discussions of uh, letter from the district in reporting on uh, to the MSBA and DESE uh, the uh, programs that are in place throughout the school district. Also, um, we have been working on updating the information from the geo uh, technical exploration and uh, working on developing uh, life cycle cost analysis. So, yes. so Oops. No, good to say, man. Good to say. Okay, and officially um, organizing the selection committee. Um, Marion, hold on. Um, Mr. Dimonov, can you could you mute, please? Um, we're having a hard time hearing Ms. Williams. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Go ahead, Mary. Okay. And and then finally, we. Um, the uh, superintendent Downing and I met with the select board to um, discuss the um, MGL C40 section 22F regarding um, inspectional fees and building permit fees. And um, so that's all we have for the report for now. And I'll turn it over to the designer for presentation and then we'll uh, wind up the discussion reviewing the budget. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Olson. Thank you, Chairman. I'm just going to share my screen. And Does everybody see the screen full size? I yes. So, okay. Uh, so, just as a, as a kind of an update, um, a lot of what we're going to be talking about tonight is information that people have already seen, um, but, or with just updates to it. Um, obviously, the big part is that um, next month, at the end of next month, um, we'll be submitting the schematic design package to the MSBA. Um, and that is uh, part of what we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, so the schedule hasn't changed as far as milestones, but we're just kind of bringing that to note. Um, what we did want to talk about um, as a high, as a highlight tonight is the HVAC system. Um, I know we talked a little bit of briefly about it last uh, meeting, and this slide kind of um, is the same slide that we presented, um, where we compare a geothermal and an air source. Um, for the current design and what is in the project budget is a geothermal system. Um, and part of the reason why we're showing this and uh, Mr. Szanski had asked that again uh, last time too is um, what, why we're looking at it. And the reality is, is there's really two systems that we could, or two options that are, um, that would work for a building of this type. 
Um, and that's basically using either ground source or air source um, type heat pumps. Um, so we knew that a lot of people, especially residentially, um, have air source heat pumps in their houses. And we really wanted to bring this to the um, fore that there are those these two options um, and explain the key differences between them and in the, in the intent to answer any questions ahead of time. If people ask, well, why didn't you look at air source heat pumps? Um, well, we wanted to bring it, it to everybody's attention that they do exist, obviously. But what, why geothermal is the, uh, what we recommend is the better solution for you as a district based on all the facts and all the discussions we've had. Um, and I'm not going to reiterate um, what we've talked about here with the benefits and the challenges of each one. Um, but the biggest one is why we recommend the geothermal over air source is that the, um, the system would require the supplemental backup emergency heat um, and, and then dependence on fossil fuels just as we know um there's people that do have heat pumps in their house so that it can't really keep up when the temperature drops below 20 degrees or less really um that's really kind of the breaking point for it um and part of the challenge is when school's in session is during the winter so and when the building's regularly occupied so that's why air source tend to not be the the optimal solution um for um, a school um but so what we've done is to help people understand a little bit better about um, why we are recommending and why the current project, the con project includes geothermal in it, um, but why we do list air sources and alternate just so that we can educate everybody on the facts is we've done a, a preliminary life cycle cost analysis. Uh, we know that this analysis is going to get more and more refined as we develop the project, um, as we know more about the building meaning the HVAC demands, et cetera, um, as well as the current um, analysis as far as the thermal conductivity of the soils. Um, and so the more conductive the soils are, the less wells we would need. Uh, but what we've done at this point is taken a, um, what we would consider a realistic um, and, but not aggressive approach um, where we have, uh, we show we call it for 140 wells based on the known information um, we hope that that number could get reduced down to even 120 wells, which is why we're giving that range. But when we look at this, um, the whole building UI is how you really measure a building as far as its energy efficiency. Um, and what we what we did to help everybody understand this is you really see three options here. Uh, three, And so the baseline is the building code minimum. And so we have to use when we compare something, we want to compare against something for our analysis. And so what we, the industry standard and the way the building code is actually written is you do co compare against the building code minimum. So why we show this, even as you're looking at it, is the building code minimum is not eligible for the additional MSBA reimbursement. Um, the, there's the pretend there's not really any potential energy rebates because you're doing the bare minimum. And you can see your energy cost is significantly higher than the other options for your total uh, annual energy cost. And so when we compare that here, and we, I, I want to, we show this to give a range of between 120 and 140 wells. The budget is for 140 wells um, because of what we know for information so far. And so when you look at that and you compare that between the installed cost, um, geothermal does have a higher cost to install, but um, it's a much better system in the New England and just general in general speaking, as far as sustainability energy efficiency so one thing you'll note is even there's this the the energy companies mass save give a significant higher rebate amount for geothermal because they recognize that it has a higher installed cost um, to it so they're they want to offset that installed cost because of the um, how productive of a system it is um, so as we look down and really going down here you'll see the annual um energy that uh that so cost is about this and these are just estimates based on um, today's energy costs when we're looking at them is so against the baseline system there's an average annual um, savings of using geothermal of a, about one hundred and fifty two thousand um, dollars when we compare that to the air source as I mentioned earlier it's um, it does have a demand on fossil fuels but it's less expensive to install um, there's less rebates 
both of these options are eligible for the additional uh, two percent MSBA reimbursement, which is what we show in this category here. What that percentage would be, and so when we take that and you look across the board with the total initial cost, is the actual initial cost? Yes, is a is a couple million higher, um, about three million higher. What we're seeing, but it could be two to three million higher, but the return on investment because of the energy savings is between four to 10 years. So the premium that you paid for geothermal pays itself off within four to 10 years because of the additional potential energy rebates. And, and, and furthermore, when you look at it is over the 50, because we're looking at this building as a 50 year building um, when we're designing it is you'll note you know, that the actual cost um, for the system because of the payback is lower over the 50 year uh, term of it too. Um, so in the end, geothermal really why we recommend it is that it gives you the most energy efficient, uh, the, it gives you the best from a thermal comfort um, and it is the more simple system to maintain, um, obviously but more energy efficient. So, um, and that's what we've included in the budget that we're gonna be talking about a little bit later tonight. Uh, but we did want to educate everybody on that and help everybody understand um, why geothermal. Um, this has been discussed with um, Rob Frieswick um, from the district as he's the put him and his team are the who's going to have to maintain the system uh, and talk to that in great detail and help them understand it. Um, and so that that's really kind of what we've presented. We wanted to present tonight and help everybody understand why geothermal is really the right solution. Um, although it does have a, a smaller premium up front, it pays itself back almost in, in when you think about it between four to 10 years over a 50 year life cycle of building. That's a pretty good return on investment. Uh, Mr. Olson, let me just stop you right here for one second. Yep. Do, would you prefer to uh, complete your uh, report or do you want to take uh, questions as we go along? Why don't we expression? address this right now while it's on out here? And then because uh, the next slide, Mr. Milani is going to take over. So um, if people have questions on this, I can talk to it right now. Okay, so um, let me first uh, recognize Mr. Sikansky. Uh, you had a question, Mr. Sikansky? Yes, thank you. Um, you answered the question I originally raised my hand for, but during your conversation, your uh, description, <clears throat> is there a difference in operational costs to... Um, uh, aside from the energy cost, is there a, a difference in cost be, in, in personnel and the amount of time that the Neshoba is going to have to uh, devote to these different systems over the, the lifetime of them? Is one yeah, more that's... expensive? As, aside from the electrical costs, is one noticeably, notably more expensive to operate than the other? Yeah, an air source heat pump is more expensive to operate um, just from uh, the chillers and the maintenance to those where um, a geothermal is just the pumps. So the only, the difference is, is the, the pumps, but an air source would still have the pumps as well as the the fans and all of those. So there's more maintenance required for an air source heat pump. And, and those additional costs aren't captured anywhere on this chart. Is that correct? They're, they're included into the, the total cost. Uh, when we were doing, when they um, were calculating it, there's a software that kind of does that for our, engineers and that captures the, those anticipated costs the average costs so that okay. was um built into the total cost okay thank you mm -hmm. uh go ahead mr buck i uh, i actually i have i have one of things i have a fine question from mr sikansky you said that the operating cost is baked into the Total cost, is it baked into the line item installed HVAC cost? So this installed HVAC is not the upfront cost to install the system, but includes maintenance over its 50-year lifetime? No, the initial cost is just the what it would cost the contractor to install okay. the system. So which of these line items has the total cost of maintaining the systems over the course of their lifetimes? So when they when we were going through this, it, it's really built into when our our engineers were doing it. Is it's kind of built into these numbers as far as the maintenance of it. Um, I don't know exactly what they are, um, but they're really built in. It's it's 
really built into the payback period is, is the maintenance that's required for those systems. Um, give me one second here. Mm -hmm. Craig, I think that the, the um, amount of maintenance time that would be required for the different systems, uh, according to our discussions with Rob and with um, other engineers, is that obviously the baseline uh, building code minimum system is the most uh, labor intensive in terms of maintenance, followed by uh, the air source and the geothermal being mostly a passive system, um, not pulling you know, heat out of the air, but actually, you know, just moving water uh, yeah, like well, we through the belt, through the wells. Yeah. You know, it's what most we often see in these systems um, is they're, they're sophisticated, um, the, an air source system with the chillers and all that, that most districts will contract a maintenance contract with a, um, a specialist to maintain those systems uh, where the pumps of, a, of a, the well, the geothermals are much more simple. Um, that might not that the, the the staff might be able to manage it internally on their own. So it's tough to really capture maintenance cost as a whole because every district's different, whether they can handle it themselves or that. Um, so, but the the general rule of thumb is yes, the air source have a higher maintenance cost to them. Just even the chillers, um, for instance, as an example, is the chillers you drain down every year. Um, and, and those kinds of systems that, um, and clean the coils, et cetera, stuff that, um, in, in a system of this size is that you wouldn't necessarily have to do on a residential, um, but they have a. So should I, should I read, uh, should I read the total cost over 50 years as being the cost to install the system, the cost of energy, which is the total energy cost presumably times 50 years and then some amount of maintenance and service that is not broken out as a line item in the table and yeah so yeah when i i see that i'm looking at what the engineers gave us too is um what we have here is based on just the total cost and it doesn't include the maintenance costs in these in what you see here because without knowing exactly how things would be set up they, they we couldn't put an actual number at it um at this point meaning like as you know if there's a service contract etc so the numbers we're presenting here are only based on the initial costs and then the energy costs and don't include the maintenance costs in them i misspoke earlier okay uh, but then the maintenance costs for an air source are typically higher um, and I don't know the exact amount, but I know that they are generally higher annually um, than a geothermal system. Okay, got it. I I think I think that maybe some of the maybe some of the maybe I'm doing the math wrong. But if you if you take the initial cost and multiply the energy cost by fifty, you don't get the total costs that are at the bottom line of this table. So I'm and I only did the first two columns real quick, but. It seems like maybe there's something in there that's not correct, but maybe we can we can set that aside for just a moment. the The actual reason that I raised my hand here was that um, the estimated payback period is relative to the code minimum baseline, but I think we're not contemplating the code minimum baseline in any scenario. And I I just wanted to clarify from probably my own understanding that if we consider the air source heat pump as our baseline, that the payback period for the geothermal is north of 40 years because the incremental cost for the geothermal is on the order of $3 million, but then the annual energy savings is only 65.6. And so I think the, the comparison between geo, excuse me, between geothermal and air source is, is very nearly the 50 year total life cycle of the system. Is that correct? Are you, I know that I threw a lot of numbers at you all at once. Yeah, we didn't calculate the, we didn't compare them, the two side by side in that standpoint. We okay. just compared it to the code minimum. Sure, uh, but like, so I would have to, we'd have to re, we'd have to modify everything and re, re, you know, to actually have me give you an answer on that. Yeah, because I mean, ultimately, we're, we're trying to make a decision between either a geothermal or an air source heat pump, but those two options are not effectively compared to each other here. 
only relative. Yeah, I, I think um, even to that standpoint is even what we're to to respond to your comment is is what we would recommend is that we that the group not make a decision at this point to be candid with you um, because but we're giving you the facts so you can make it and it, it make a decision to not make a decision that you would carry the current geothermal system because the the when we look at the numbers of it that the when you budget you want to budget it for the best uh worst case scenario in a sense and that's where we're looking to establish a budget for the project um can, can i just jump in for one second sure. I'm, it's hard for me to keep my mouth shut too long because i i want to <laughs> add some things i know i'm stepping out of line but that maybe will help some some understanding right now the decision is not necessarily to go between the air source and the geothermal. Yeah. It's that's a decision that still has to be fully flushed out and discussed. And it, it really is going to come down to what the final costs of when the design is fully done. Okay. Cause there's a lot of things, even with the wells that one of the things that uh, KBA has done is they've, they've estimated all these things and they've, they've kind of, um, not overestimated, but have very um, good allowances in a lot of the things that they've they've um, uh, put together, whether it's the cost of the wells or the total number, so that we're covered, okay? The hope is that those allowances are going to come down in some of those cases. I kind of use this as uh, um, it, it, sometimes you overestimate to the place where you lose a job, and that's almost what's happening a little bit to the geothermal. I think some of those things are overestimated. But the good thing is the geothermal is what's in the current budget. If at the end of the day, some further analysis with the whole system determines that the air source between life cycle costs and all that is a better way, we can still go down that road to save that money if that money is really there to save. All the differences between the geothermal and the, uh, and the air source is how we're actually giving the heat to the same systems. The geothermal is a closed loop system. You're sending uh, glycol or water into the ground, extracting or losing heat into the ground and then putting it back into essentially the same equipment that the air source is doing. Um, one of the things that's so hard for a lot of people to put in their heads is that right now, everybody from most homeowners are saying air to air heat pumps are the way to go right? Everybody's putting them in, Mitsubishi systems, all these systems. The reason for that is they're, they're relatively inexpensive and have a shorter, for a homeowner, are quicker to pay off, but they only last, you know, 20, 10, 20 years or so. Geothermal is a long-term commitment because they're so expensive up, up front. So if you had an unlimited budget in your house, I would always recommend to put geothermal in but it doesn't happen. Most people can't afford to put geothermal in from wells are just very expensive. And the payback time is longer than normal people will keep their residences. But when you're talking about buildings like this, where you're talking about something that you want to last for 50 years, geothermal makes sense because of, because of, of those reasons. Does that help a little bit? Um, yeah. And even it does, to, it does, to I think. speak a little I bit to the details of it, um, which you mentioned a little bit, Ken, in the standpoint of, and to answer the question about maintenance of that too, is when you have a geothermal system because of its efficiency, and I mentioned the um, a backup emergency heat system, a supplementary heat system. So you would need gas-fired boilers, the gas tank, uh, and a whole secondary heating system that you would not, that is not required with the geothermal. So that's a whole nother system that would be, have to be required to be maintained annually by uh, facilities. It's it's different than that something we would have to do in a, a large scale building like this that um, wouldn't necessarily need it as a, in a residential standpoint. Um, and so that that's one big item um, when we look at that, this too. Craig, if I can, maybe we can, we can short this all a little bit. I think, I think this is great. I understand that it's preliminary. I guess um, the reason that I'm asking the questions is to some degree, there are, there are members of the public that see these presentations that watch this recording on Bolton TV, right? And ask things like, hey, I heard that you're putting in a really expensive geothermal system. 
when will that pay back? And I think it looks like it's going to take maybe 40 years to pay back. And that's that's fine. And we can talk about it being preliminary. But I, I want to make sure that we all have the right numbers and, and we have, to the best of our ability, complete numbers so that it includes things like long-term maintenance. If there's an additional cost for the air source option that is all of the backup and emergency heat, that like the numbers that we're talking about in a public venue are correct and complete and up to date so that we can have intelligent conversations with members of the community. And I understand we're not making a decision. This is just a, this is a budget to to put a number on paper and hopefully it will be lower, et cetera, et cetera. But like, yeah, I think, I I think want to do something with the numbers, right? Right. And I think, I, I think what I've seen, you know, working in the, in the groups during the week is that all the estimators have put in all the redundancies and the things that are, are possible to be needed with a geothermal system that my guess is some of those will get scaled back, but it's, we're better off planning for that now to hopefully pull that back. And the history that I've seen, I think there's going to be some stuff that gets pulled back, but I'd rather we plan on 140 wells. That's what we've got in the current budget. That's what we do with the hope that we're only going to need 120. Um, it's just, it's, it's hard because most people are trying to equate a, a house you you build and you know you're you're going to be in it for maybe 20 years versus a school that in a commercial building that you want to last much longer um so it is it's it, it is hard to 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 relate to i i honestly i see it happen so much that everybody wants geothermal once we start when you talk about the, the upfront front costs they're just um uh, they're, they they outprice themselves very quickly for 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 most people uh, on a residential basis all right, let me um let me just jump in here for a minute. Um Ms. Co- Ms. Cohen had her hand raised. Amy, do you have a question? Uh Ken just answered it. So. Okay. Thank you. And, and Mr. Fromer, do you have uh you had your hand up for some time as well. Do you have a question? No, I just had my hand up because I was itching oh, to speak. Okay. So you know, if you if you <laughs> just, just just shoot me a chat, just show me a, a, a direct message if you need me to interrupt. The meeting to uh, interject a point, okay. a salient point. Um, one last thing, Mr. Olson, before we let you go on this. Um, in setting up this meeting, I, I did invite members of the district committee who will be meeting subsequent to this meeting and uh, voting on the project budget. I did get one question from one of our school committee members. Mr. Powell, would you like to inquire of Mr. Olson? I, for- I forgot my question. I wrote it down. <laughs> oh, right. Um, yeah, the question was about, is there, is, is there the potential to exhaust a geothermal reservoir? Like I know that the, the geothermal is getting the energy from inside the ground. Is it possible that you exhaust that source of energy? No, um, with geothermal, the, the goal as part of the design as we're doing it is to provide a balance is a balance because you don't want to heat the, you want to balance the soils out annually meaning the amount of heat you take out of the soil in the winter gets put back in in the cooling season. And so it's all about the design um, and it becomes very scientific. I'll say that um, uh, well beyond the realm of an architect talking about it. Um, but the, uh, the, the the whole design of it with the way they do it, especially when we like we talk about the thermal conductivity of the soils, et cetera, that there ultimately is is to balance the system for the system to be efficient. It has to be balanced annually. Great, thank you, yep. Mr. Olson. You know, maybe um, at our next meeting, uh, we might want to reinvite Mr. Park to come back and elucidate a little more on geothermal. Yeah, I think what we'll do is we do have a geothermal consultant um, that's the one that's doing the thermal conductivity tests right now and everything, and uh, the the wells were um, installed. Um, and they're in the monitoring phase right now. So they're actually they have equipment out there right now in the wells monitoring the conductivity of the soils. So when we do meet again, they're gonna we'll we'll have a better understanding and they can really talk through the science of it some more. Uh, right. Definitely. But in real in just in real quick terms, this is that when we're talking about wells, these are closed loop wells. So we're not extracting water or anything. So we're not we're not draining water, we're just extracting that heat. So you know, below four four foot in the ground, the temperature stays at a constant, basically 50 degrees year round. And that's, that's what we're extracting that heat, that heat. 
where an air-to-air heat source in the middle of winter, you could try basically trying to be getting heat out of 20 degrees or 10 degrees and stuff like that. That's why the geothermal tends to be more consistent because, or more efficient because that temperature year round is consistent. Thank you, Mr. Frommer. All right, Mr. Olson, um, anything further? I don't have anything further. I'm actually going to hand it over to Mr. Milani. Thank you. Um, to kind of give further design update. Evening, everybody. Um, this is the site plan. Uh, all the all the images you see tonight are uh, both the latest design as of today. As I mentioned before, this stuff changes virtually daily. Uh, we're always tweaking and trying to improve the design, but we're at a point right now where uh, we are trying to um, uh, wrap up and collate what we have. Uh, we feel that the design has developed to a point that we can uh, uh put together the package to submit to the MSBA uh, uh, at the end of June. Uh, and so we're moving forward with basically what you see and uh, finishing up all the, the backup material that goes with it. So this site plan really hasn't changed since the last time uh, we talked. Um, uh, we still have the loop road that goes around for the buses. Uh, and we have a parent drop off that uh, goes through and drops off at the front of the building and the rotary uh, comes off of the rotary. Uh, the baseball field has been modified uh, to uh, uh, provide for a longer foul line, uh, a home run and, a, and a, a longer center field home run distance from home plate that made us uh, required us to move the road a little bit in the parking lot a little bit, but we didn't lose any parking as a result. Um, one thing that we have done uh, as we went through the process with the estimators uh, for cut and fill, we know that the site has a lot of uh, extra fill that has to be removed. We've dropped the classroom wing that Craig's outlining right now. We've dropped that down uh, two foot eight inches to try and uh, alleviate some of the costs for bringing in fill. Um, right in the middle of that classroom wing, as I mentioned before, there's a bowl and in the site that's down about seven feet from the west end of the, or the east end of the site, and that's causing us to have some fill. So we're trying to minimize that cost and the effect that that might have on the uh, the adjacent wetland buffer by uh, by dropping that classroom ring down and engaging it more into the the site than it was before because it was kind of up out of the site. Um, we have, as mentioned, Con uh, conservation commission. We did uh, have a meeting. Uh, with the conservation agent to go through the plan and get um, her advice as to how we should proceed. Um, we'll be in the process of submitting an ANRAD to the uh, Conservation Commission. It's supposed to be put in this Friday. So that will allow us to be on the docket for a Conservation Commission uh, review coming up at their uh, one of their June uh, meeting dates. Uh, as Craig mentioned, uh, the geothermal wells are two test wells are in the process of being uh, uh, tested now for conductivity testing. Uh, we expect that work to be done in uh, about a week. Uh, it takes two days to run each test, 48 hours for each test is the minimum time you have to have the test run to get uh, viable results. And then uh, our uh, geothermal consultant uh, will be going through their analysis of those results to um, to determine what the connectivity is and how that affects the building and allow us to uh, affect the, uh, the loads in the building. Uh, uh, one thing we didn't mention uh, in the previous discussion was that um, uh, the reason that these discussions about the geothermal wells are preliminary is because we don't have an energy, uh, uh, energy model yet for the building. The building isn't developed enough to do an energy model and that's typically done in the next phase of work. Uh, and so as we get into that phase of work and have more uh, uh, understanding of the of the load that's on the building, it will tell us uh, the amount of wells that are needed to support that load. And right now, we just don't we don't know that. So we're, that's why we're trying to give you a range of where we could be based on both the connectivity and the load that's necessary. Um, our our potable well consultant has also been on site uh, to do his uh, 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 geological review of the site and his. Uh, it uses a, a LIDAR system to map some of the underside uh, of the ground for uh, fractures uh, and wells uh, locations. So the first well that he looked at was being put over by the tennis courts on the right-hand side of the site. And uh, his recommendation has been to provide a secondary well that would be up uh, adjacent to the um, existing uh, pump station that's in the, uh, I call it the hobbit hole, but the 
uh, buried uh, uh, pump station that's for the wells on the southeastern portion of the football field. We thought that was the most economical uh, way to go. Um, also, as I mentioned previously, uh, we do send these site plans to the Tennessee gas uh, people just to keep them in the loop. Uh, my scheduled delivery date for this month is this week. Uh, and so I'll be forwarding uh, this plan as basically a final plan for them to review um, uh, on Friday of this week. Uh, next slide. Uh, so again, um, uh, here are the, the, the floor plans. Um, again, you may not recognize the tweaks that we've done since the last uh, iteration. Um, uh, primarily, uh, two things have happened. Um, the first, uh, where the cursor is now showing um, the uh, connection of the student commons now visually to uh, the exterior of the building. One of the uh, items that we had uh, brought up to us in the visioning sessions uh, has was the uh, uh, making a living atrium. And of course, we're not going to have uh, plants probably in the student commons because it tends to, to require a lot of maintenance. Um, and so typically we want to have that as an abstracting, but also provide visual connection to the outside and to uh, nature, um, uh, biophilic uh, requirements for, uh, for health. Uh, so we've, we've modified the location of that passage that you see going through the curtain wall where the cursor is. Uh, to widen it and to provide a direct view line through from the student commons that uh, re required us to modify the shape of the media center. Uh, the stair that goes to the second floor, um, as you might recall, was a very large stair that was curving and hugging that media center that uh, uh, took up a lot of the visual connection to uh, the wetland buffer area. Um, also, the ramp uh, has been modified to move towards the foods lab in the nurse area to make it so it was much narrower uh, and stacked. So it, that is really a defined access point between the lower classroom wing uh, and the, uh, the higher student commons area, because as I said, we lowered that classroom wing down. So now we have to provide a ramp to get from one side to the other. But the whole point of this exercise uh, was to finally, after a lot of, uh, I wouldn't say schizophrenic, but a, a lot of contradictory work that, trying to get that, that, that view plane from the student commons out to the wetland buffer and provide that visual connection to the exterior and nature. Uh, second thing that we did was to modify the, um, the small learning communities slightly. Um, as you can see, they used to look like two legs at the end and now the, the, the science labs at the end are offset. We felt that gave a better uh, transition to an exterior classroom space uh, and provided a small breakout space towards the the exterior exit. Uh, the second thing that we did, it's hard to see because the word small learning community is over it, is that we moved the stair uh, adjacent to um, the exit you see right to the left where the cursor is. Um, and that you'll see in one of the images that we're gonna present provides a uh, both a visual and a physical connection between the project-based learning spaces on the first floor and the second floor right where the cursor is there. Um, we felt this was a, a better uh, use of, of the stair and provided uh, that connection that we have been trying to get for quite a long time. Uh, but this actually seems to be um, uh, the solution that we had been trying to develop since you know, we started this phase of the project. Um, not much else has changed. Like I said, little tweaks here and there. We have updated the auditorium um, slightly to uh, make it more efficient. Uh, we've modified the kitchen server to make it more efficient. Um, and we are, are constantly looking for ways to save on our gross square footage, um, which is limited by the MSBA to 1.5 times the usable square footage in the building. Uh, we feel that we're there. Uh, we've just, uh, we're always looking for ways to um, uh, better utilize the gross square footage corridors, wall, stuff like that, so that they're, they're functional um, and have multi-purpose rather than just being a corridor. Uh, next. So as you may recall back, uh, we have had uh, some uh, images that we presented to uh, both the working group and this group as uh, inspirations for us uh, and what, the, what has been sort of narrowed down by the working group as what they felt was more appropriate to uh, the type of building that they wanted to see on the site. Um, uh, I think Craig mentioned the last meeting that there are um, 
uh, requirements in the zoning ordinance uh, for uh, sloped roofs and uh, sort of barn-like structures. Uh, and so we've tried to incorporate that into some of the, some of the images and, and the forms that we have in the building. Again, not trying to use uh, uh, historic uh, uh, materials from uh, Bolton and the surrounding area. Fireless color. Whoops, who's that? <laughs> uh, stone. Uh, timber um, and uh, siding that won't be uh, wood shakes or wood siding, but will be uh, simulated areas that'll have uh, metal panels or cementitious panels that'll rely on uh, much less uh, maintenance to, to serve them. And then also providing sunshades on areas facing uh, south and, and east to minimize the glare in the classrooms and the, and the service spaces in the building. Next. So here you see our current um, uh, view of the building looking from Route 117 Main Street um, across the parking lot. To the left are the two science lab uh, wings on the south side of, the, of that, I call it the pod, the south pod. Uh, again, we're trying to provide a, uh, a sloped roof uh, to provide a more um, uh, residential appearance to the building, a lower appearance of the building, uh, not as much of an institutional appearance of the building uh, in keeping with the the desires of the zoning ordinance. Um, and we have offset those two to provide uh, a nice outdoor space that occurs between the ends of those, those two science labs. Providing a lot of glass on the south side um, provides visibility to uh, those rooms. Uh, a lot of good stuff to see in a science lab, um, uh, but also providing sun shades along the million lines of those to, to hide the, uh, the southern sun coming in on a summer day uh, that would provide a lot of heat gain. Uh, as you can see, the slope roofs continue along in the classroom areas, just where the cursor is, uh, combining uh, materials of masonry and stone, as well as um, uh, uh, sloped roofs. Uh, and that carries over into the gymnasium, where we try to break up the large mass that you would typically get out of a gymnasium, uh, a big square box, uh, to provide uh, a more pleasant and uh, uh, residential look to that where it's a sloped roof. In the center of all this is the, is the main entrance of the building, a large glass area that houses both the entrance of the building and directly above it, the career center, uh, sort of symbolic that the career center is the jumping off point for students um, moving on from the high school and so the entering and exiting in that, cent that center part of the building. Mr. Okay. Milani, I'm going to stop you right here for a moment. I'm going sure. to recognize Ms. Cohen. She's had her hand up for quite a while. So go ahead, Amy. Thank you, Joe. Um, I, I had a question a few slides back um, when you were showing Want to go back, right? slides with kind of like the plan view. Go ahead. Back um, one more. Had to do with the tennis courts. Is there, has there been a change with, um, could you just talk about the tennis courts? Because I see that there's two Notations for two new tennis courts. I'm pretty sure one the, of them already exists. The the, but the, the one at the bottom looks like it's new, maybe replacing something off. It the is the 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 tennis courts in the the lower part of the screen in front of the the pump station are new tennis courts um, that we're proposing because the well location, the ideal well location for the new potable well is at that location with the cursors on the existing tennis courts. Um, the, the new well will require a, a small uh, enclosure on top of it. Um, difficult to get that serve past the, the box on top of the tennis courts. And so we decided that it was best to turn that back into landscape. Um, uh, potable wells also have restrictions in terms of what you can put on top of them. Um, asphalt and, and maintaining painted surfaces is a no-no when you have a potable well. So uh, that's going to become back to landscape and those tennis courts being moved over to the lower left. The tennis courts on the left side of the screen near the wetland uh, are labeled new tennis courts only because those will be reconstructed. Uh, what we don't have shown here is um, uh, a construction plan or an enabling plan. Um, we've been developing these plans to show um, how the building will transition in the summer before construction starts, obviously. Um, where the building is being built on top of the existing parking lot, new parking lots that are temporary will have to be built. Um, and that tennis court area is a, a prime location for storage of materials, trailers, and stuff like that for, for, the, for the process of the construction of the building. So those tennis courts will be out of service uh, temporarily and will have to be rebuilt new 
uh, at the end of the project. Okay, is the cost of the all those changes you just described is that included in the budget that's being yes, presented? yeah, that's okay. all in there as um, uh, it, it's either labeled as a temporary construction or, or enabling in the in the estimate. I don't recall which, but it, they're all in there. Okay. I've sent I've sent the um, the plans that we've reviewed with the working group um, for that enabling transition between, you know, existing and starting construction, all of that was sent to the estimators. They had questions. So I know they looked at it. Um, so that all is included in, in the estimates. The MSBA right. doesn't reimburse for temporary construction. So we've tried to limit what that temporary construction is, temporary parking lots, you know, stuff like that, um, but they're necessary. And so there's always, when you're working on the same site, there's always a need to have that kind of, of cost built in, but it is not a, a reimbursable, eligible for reimbursement. Okay. Um, if if the if Joe will allow, I, I did have one other question on the a slide that's already been covered um, that I think would benefit community members watching the presentation. If you could go, I think it's slide six. I'm not. It had to do with the exterior um, characteristics. Mm -hmm. So could you just talk a little bit about how choices will be made with the materials that are shown here with regard to the cost of the materials and how that factors into the budget that's been presented. Um, Cause I, well, I, you know, I think that there is a, I have heard concern over wanting to have some assurances that, you know, as these choices are made throughout the, the design of the, the project that, you know, we are taking the, the cost of these, materials into consideration. So if you could just address that. Yeah, you know, there's, there's um, our estimators uh, have a lot of experience. They constantly monitor and update their database um, of different material costs and different labor costs. Uh, and so we have uh, very good information uh, and we had discussions with them about what materials would be more cost efficient uh, of course, we're looking at construction happening um, a couple of years down the road and, and things can change. So uh, we know that um, uh, a curtain wall and glazing um, uh, is, is extremely expensive right now, although it's necessary to have uh, glazing in a, in a school to allow light in and to provide visual access. Um, uh, we've tried to provide that uh, by limiting also the amount of glass that we have. Um, there's also uh, certain materials that are more expensive uh, in terms of exterior cladding. If you don't have windows, you're gonna put something you know, on the wall. And uh, we've had discussions with them about those also. We have to strike a balance where we don't wanna make, um, as Ken said, you don't wanna overprice the building just for the sake of doing it. And we haven't done that, um, but we do have materials on the outside of the building to try and capture a cost um, so they're going into the design development phase next year or uh, next fall that we do have uh, the ability to have further discussions with both um, the working group uh, and this group to uh, uh, follow up on, on detailed elevation to show what those materials are. As we get into the design development phase next fall, there will be um, uh, much more discussion with our estimators about their current uh, costs for materials. Uh, and, and how we use them on the exterior of the building. Um, we do have several more estimates coming up, uh, a DD, a 60% CD, and a 90% CD estimate also to go through. And that'll give us kind of a back check on, on what we have for materials and, and try to figure out if we have to you know, pivot and make a, a change to a different type of material. You know, there's some, some years brick is way more expensive than other things. Some years, um, Rain screen, uh, some inches of panels are way more expensive. In some years, uh, glazing is way more expensive. It's just striking the right balance. Um, one thing we want to do is be sure that, like I said, we're covered with the cost going into design development. Um, uh, ditto with the way that we approach the cost for the geothermal or the air source heat pump. Um, when you when you get through this process and schematic design and you get a project funding agreement uh, based on um, the approved estimates and, and the 3011 form, um, that is your budget. Um, when you have um, that number set, uh, it's, it's much easier to reduce the cost, obviously, 
um, it's, uh, it's really, really, really difficult to increase the cost. Um, so going from showing a, a, a really, 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 you know, inexpensive material, either on the exterior of the building or for mechanical systems, um, for the point of reducing an initial estimate in schematic design, um, can come back to bite you because the way the MSBA works is that that's at the end of schematic design, that's your number and you cannot raising it is, is, is virtually impossible to do. So yeah, we're trying to sure. strike that balance between, between having enough uh, of value covered in the, S, in the, in the presentations, but also to be cognizant that we're not trying to overprice the building. Yeah, Joe, just to interject a couple thoughts. Um, as, as we're looking at these materials, as you mentioned, it's, it's, it's a, it's a balance um, of, but a number one priority is we are designing a 50 year building. So mm -hmm. any materials that we do look at for the building is a long-term durable solution. Um, so for instance, that's why when we say the siding isn't wood siding, it's it's a wood look siding because wood siding obviously is not a 50 year material. It would require significant maintenance um, versus a fiber cement panel or something similar to that, that has a, a, a um, more, more long-term uh, related to it. Um, and to you and to the point that Joe was mentioning is, is at the schematic design, when we establish our budget, that is what you're locking in with the MSBA on for your project funding agreement. And so even as we talk about reimbursement is for instance, and I'm going to pick on geothermal just because that's what we talked about earlier is if geothermal, if, if we said, if it decided now, for instance, which is why we're asking you to not make a decision now, but if a decision was made now to say, well, we want to do air source because it's less expensive in the budget for our total number. But then we find out as we get more information that um, although it costs a little bit more for geothermal, um, it makes the most sense for the project, which we anticipated it, it will, um, that you would be locked in at the cost of the air source heat pumps. So any additional cost would be at your 100% cost versus if the geothermal is included now as part of the budget, that would be a reimbursable cost. So any changes that increase the cost in a sense, as we say, um, would be 100% born on the district and would not be reimbursed by the MSBA. Thank you. That's an important point. Thanks for clarifying. Mm -hmm. Okay, you want to hop back a few slides, Craig? Move forward to me. I forget where we were. I think it was the second image of the elevation. This is a close up showing more of the materials. You can see we're trying to engage the building uh, to the earth with uh, 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 an ashlar kind of stone base. Uh, that base forms uh, frames for the classroom wings that are infilled with uh, masonry. Uh, and then on the science wings, a more high-tech surface where we'd have uh, either a metal wall panel or a uh, cementitious rain screen system. Uh, slope roofs to provide uh, shade for the, from the sun on the west side, I'm mean, assuming the east side and south side of the building, uh, and also to provide um, uh, a lowering of the, of the effect of the building as more residential. They also function to hide the rooftop units so that you don't see the yes, rooftop yeah, units yeah. on top of the building. Yeah, rooftop units are going to be about 10 feet high in this building, and, and those are helpful to do that. Next. Looks like my car in front of the school. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a, here's a couple of uh, images um, of the uh, interior of the building. Uh, this first one is looking from the cafeteria uh, common space. Uh, with your back to the gymnasium looking west through the curtain wall towards the, uh, the green space on the outside, that visual connection to the exterior. Um, you may rem remember from some of our previous um, uh, images that uh, there was a large curved stair there or something else, and it was kind of blocking that, that view. This provides two connections, the, the, the bridge connection on the second floor and the uh, corridor connection on the first floor. Now, are completely engaged from uh, the pods on the north and south to the common space, which is the heart of the school. Um, the, uh, the media center, while being a focal point, uh, is no longer uh, blocking that view. 
Um, when you come in the front uh, door uh, for the school, you are on access with the auditorium as a primary element in the, um, in the cafeteria common space. Uh, we feel that even though the stair is not uh, sized to be uh, as large as it was, that that really was kind of a, a, a waste of space. Uh, we've integrated a uh, small group learning space uh, and sitting space within uh, the transition space between the common space and the classroom wings. This does two things. It um, provides a breakout space for people either during lunchtime or during the day, but also provides a, a breakout space for the foods lab. The foods lab is located just to the left off screen. Um, and whether it's during the day or during um, uh, evening events at the auditorium or the gymnasium, uh, that that can serve as a, a place for students to provide, um, you know, snacks and whatever to uh, a very comfortable seating area that's in that common space uh, between the two uh, classroom wings. We've now developed this as a, uh, a really functional gallery space for the art rooms that are on the second floor. Um, and at the same time, uh, opened it up visually so that a lot of light is there. It draws you toward that side of the building. Uh, and it no longer seems like a dark corridor just to walk into the classroom. This is now a, uh, a, what we think right now is our optimum solution uh, at this point. Uh, one thing we're trying to do is to bring um, the exterior materials in. It doesn't show completely here, um, but the stone that we have on the exterior of the building uh, we'd like to bring in to create that impression of um, the outside coming in, the nature coming into the building, that, that biophilic connection between outside and inside. One of the, um, as I mentioned, one of the requests in our visioning sessions was to have this um, living atrium. Um, we don't want to create the Hanging Gardens of Babylon here, but we do want to create uh, a feeling that um, there's natural materials coming inside and outside the building. So there's that, that connection. And then also using um, uh, materials, uh, uh, wood, wood veneers and things like that, and uh, colors that will provide uh, references to nature, um, uh, colors for, for, for meadows or grass or trees or whatever, um, and carrying that through. In our, we, ha we have a lot of developments that we haven't shown here that we have for the interior of the building. Um, but those are still in development, so we didn't feel comfortable showing them right now. But we, we are trying to work with that, that desire to connect the, the insides uh, of the building with the exterior of the building. Yeah, one of the things we were talking about as we were in our design meetings to, uh, that Joe kind of is alluding to is, is the um, tying into the vernacular of, of the towns, of the, the rolling hills, meadows, orchards, um, with the tree lines and the New England stone walls. The historic stone walls and really bringing that in and evoking that as this these this area being kind of the rolling meadow in the the orchards um, with the tree lined along the the outside along the edges of the meadow and like for instance this wall could become that stone wall we look to bring some of those mm -hmm. interior materials uh, exterior materials into the building and kind of that's the 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 feeling the biophilic kind of connection to not only just nature but also to the local um, vernacular of, of your your towns mm -hmm. next and the second slide is looking at um, a view in the project-based learning spaces in the classroom wings and the pods uh, I noted that we had moved the stair to be uh, transverse uh, going across this uh, as you can see we have a project based learning space uh, on the lower part of the screen um, that kind of goes off screen towards us, um, open to the second floor and the project based learning space on the far end of the image that you see where the cursor is. Um, you can see uh, cord reels on the roof, uh, the ceiling line to provide access to electrical power, um, uh, light fixtures, um, and uh, uh, casework built in to provide storage areas for behind the wall, half wall that you see there and below under the stair to utilize that space to its maximum possibility and provide storage space for use of materials in those project-based learning areas. Um, we felt that this, this visual and physical connection in this way um, uh, better served the, uh, both the functionality of these spaces, utilize the space to its optimum uh, and visually connected them in a way that we felt was important. 
Uh, Mr. Milani, let me just stop you right here for one second. One of our members had just inquired, I think it's regarding slide nine, asking if that's the uh, location where the students will be eating lunch. Yes. Okay, thank you. That's the co student commons is, is AKA the cafeteria. Thank you. And the, the servery is just off to the lower right side of the slide. I think it's important to know what we're showing. This is the first time we're really showing these images uh, mm -hmm. publicly is that these, these are going to evolve over time. Mm -hmm. um, but the, it's really to give people a better understanding of how the building is kind of developing. Um, it's going to change again, uh, as I mentioned, multiple iterations through this, but the idea of the materials, for instance, the material you see uh, as the brown would be a wall tile. Uh, materials so we're kind of having people understanding how the budget's built around that too um wall tile being a durable material that doesn't require facilities to have to paint every year um and those things so it's again that the balance of durability to maintenance and although so where there's high active areas it's utilizing wall tile and um, then can again, you go back to the plan craig there was a pop-up question about the elevator that'll be very quick yep Two more, three more. Here you go. So um, the with the cursors right there, the elevator is placed along the the ramp at the landing of the ramp at the foods lab between the foods lab and the nurses' office. We wanted it located there so that it was uh, easily accessible from the main entrance, um, and uh, also easily accessible from the classroom wings. So students need to use them. We'll be able to get to them from the classroom wings. It's also servicing. Uh, kids coming in the main entrance that are going directly upstairs to get to the bridge program on the second floor. Um, they felt that having direct access to an elevator was helpful to them. And so we did that. There is also a secondary elevator right now that's in the media, excuse me, in the auditorium. Uh, and that's to provide access between the first and second levels of the auditorium. There is a, there's not a balcony, but the, the auditorium is open uh, and connects between the first floor and the second floor with seating. And so to get up and down from that, um, you cannot exit the, the, the auditorium by code. And so we're providing right now an elevator within the uh, auditorium space. So there are two elevators in the building. Uh, Mr. Malone, let me just stop you here one more time uh, for an administrative announcement. Um, if any of the members of the building committee and or the district committee have questions, I would request that you kindly raise your hand and articulate those questions as opposed to putting them in the uh, the chat. So uh, I will allow questions from district committee members as well, though we will mm -hmm. be meeting as sub subsequent to this meeting. But if you do have a question, please raise your hand and articulate mm -hmm. it for the video. Thank you, uh, Mr. Milani. Sorry sure. for the interruption. That's right. Let's scooch on, Craig. I believe that's the end of the um, Presentation. design update. So um, we'll kind of turn it back over to Skanska. Great. Thank Ms. you Williams. all very much. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. So what you're looking at um, should be very familiar. It's what we saw at our last meeting. Um, Try to simplify it visually so that it could be um, read easy, you know, more easily. Uh, so what we're looking for is uh, all the costs associated with the project are uh, subject to the regulations of 963 CMR 2.16 section five. And that's the Mass School Building Authority grant program. And that really dictates what's categorically eligible, ineligible, and where there may be caps which we've all discussed in the past. Um, and, and for those who in the audience that may not have uh, seen this before, we also have a document from um, the March 17th, I'm sorry, the March 9th board meeting that talks about eligibility and costs and reimbursement. So what we're looking for here is the total project cost is $241,714,926. The estimated maximum amount of, of eligible uh, re for reimbursement is $118,934,842. And so what we do is we look at the maximum reimburse amount calculation where the estimated maximum amount 
of space that's eligible for reimbursement is again the 118-934-842 with a 53.09% reimbursement rate. You'll see that calculation comes down to the line below. Total maximum reimbursement amount is 63,142,507 dollars. Uh, the MSBA for uh, commissioning costs associated with ineligible uh, building area is a clawback of $7,077. So the total maximum reimbursement amount based on the $241.7 million, if you spent every penny in the project, the maximum amount that you would receive from the MSBA on eligible costs would be $63 $135,430. So in summary, what we're looking for is the approval of the project budget tonight for the $241,714,926. And there's the breakout of the district share, which is $178,759,490. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Uh, Mr. Sikansky, before I get to you, I'm actually going to recognize Ms. Kendall for a motion if she is paying attention. Okay. Um, I move to approve the schematic design project budget as presented in the total amount of $241,714,926.00. I further move that the Neshoba Regional High School Building Committee recommend that the Neshoba Regional School District Committee that it approve the schematic design project budget in the total amount of $241,714,926.00 as stated aforesaid and to direct Skanska USA, the owner's project manager, to include and or submit this approved schematic design project budget to the Massachusetts School Building Authority on behalf of the Neshoba Regional School District, no later than June 27th, 2023. Thank you, Ms. Kendall. Do I have a second on the motion? Second. Uh, who is that, Mr. Fromer? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Fromer. Okay, uh, discussion, Mr. Sikansky. Yes, um, at the top of this um, spreadsheet, the feasibility study agreement. Why are we voting to authorize spending that when that's already been authorized and been spent? And yes, why are we asking for that money a second time? Go ahead, Marin. Uh, we're not asking for the money a second time. What we're saying is the overall total budget inclusive of the feasibility study is 241,000. We're following the format of the MSBA's document and they require that we put that in there. Otherwise you would be taking the 1.5 million. So they're trying to make it very clear uh, in total and tracking the total budget. Well, if, if we were to go to a vote of the towns tomorrow, would we be going with 241, 714, 926, or that number less, $1.5 million? You'd be going with that number as a total project budget, inclusive of the feasibility. And when, you know, once this is submitted, there'll be a, a process where uh, Neshoba will be invited to what they call a project scope and budget conference. And it will have a document that, that identifies all of this. And so um, it's it's their form, their process, and and it is actually filled out correctly. I I I don't doubt that it's filled out according to the MSBA requirements, but to me and to the average public person, we're asking for this. We're going to be asked for the same money twice. Well, that will not be the case. Ms. Kinsey, do you have anything further? No, I'll take that as a no. All right, Ms. Vivrito. Thanks, Joe. Uh, forgive me if I missed this, but 
Can you explain to me why the architectural and engineering drawings are there's so the number is so much lower for the reimbursement rate? Yes. So um, there was a time where the MSBA had full participation in the designer uh, architectural engineering fees, as well as for administration for the OPM. And over time, as their reimbursement per square foot of construction has gone up, there are other places where they have reduced their participation. And each, each category has its own formula for their participation. I see. And then that is applicable, too, to the construction line item. That is a result of the square foot cap. Correct. That the square foot cap is $393 per square foot for eligible spaces. And that's not to suggest that that's the cost of a, of a or should be the cost of a school building. It's, it's just stating that that's what their participation is. It's not, the MSBA is not meant to uh, fund the school project. It's meant to uh, participate and in, in ease uh, the overall cost of the project. Thank you. Okay. I'm Ms. Cohen, go ahead. Yes, could you remind me, um, is this a, a straight split between member towns, the district share? Or <laughs> I think this might be a question more for Kirk than for Marianne. But. Um, correct, or maybe even. I could actually. There, I'll, I'll answer oh, the ahead, question. Go, go ahead, Superintendent Downing. Go ahead. Yeah, Ms. Cohen, it's based upon the regional agreement and how um, uh, debt is proportioned to the towns, and that's based on high school enrollment of each of the individual towns. And then also remember that this is the budget, and so we'll determine what the shares are. It will be up to town officials to determine um, on what their local assessments are going to look like based upon the financial conditions of each individual town. Thank you, Superintendent Downing. Uh, Ms. Vibrito, do you have anything to add to that? I was just going to say the same thing, that it's up to the regional agreement, and Kirk answered it. Thank you very much. Hey, Joe? Yes, Mr. Eckel. Forgive me, I couldn't figure out how to raise my hand. I think it's also based on a five-year rolling average too. Isn't that right, Mr. Downing? That capital calculation. Uh, Mr. Eckel, the annual operating budget is based on the five-year rolling average, not the uh, high school uh, debt exclusions or debt collection. Okay, capital is a different calculation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Cohen, do you have anything further? Okay, Mr. Yesway. Uh, thank you, Chair Gleason. Uh, this is probably a question best for Ms. Williams, but anybody who, who has a good answer for this neophyte can uh, uh, chime in and help me a little bit. Is it typical or atypical generally to see such a big delta between uh, the Commonwealth reimbursement rate that you just mentioned of about 350 bucks a foot, whatever that figure was, and what we're budgeting effectively 700 bucks or more. I know it's, it seems to be um, at the root of uh, what appears to be, uh, I don't want to say a point of contention, but a point of curiosity in the community right now um, that leads to the delta between the 53% uh, reimbursement rate that's on the right-hand side of the slide and what I might call the effective reimbursement rate of the whole project closer to 30%. The root of it is really the delta between the 94 million and the 199 million. But maybe as you said, it, the idea is not for the 350 bucks a foot or so to be representative of a typical construction cost total figure but instead simply what the reimbursement rate is. So it, my question is, is it typical to see a greater than 2X delta between those two figures? Uh, I'd like to answer that question if I may, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, Ms. Williams. 
Yes. So um, it's a function of where we are right now in time. If, if, as you see the cost of construction going up and the cost of reimbursement going up, cost of construction is going up much faster than the cost of reimbursement. And so if, if you looked at a school that was built um, or, or that was funded through the MSBA uh, back five years ago, you might find the cost of the school between 400 and 600 dollars per square foot. And then, um, and I apologize to, to others because I uh, sort of told this to me in the past a few times that first we had COVID, then we had storms in Texas, then we, then we had tornadoes in Southern states, then we had the Suez Canal, then we had a, an issue with um, materials, uh, you know, sitting on ships on the West Coast and not being able to get them trucked to other places. And it's the supply and demand, um, you know, situation where it, it, it got bigger than all of us what happened, what happened in the world. And, and as a result, it, it really drove costs up in a way that historically we hadn't seen. So with construction, typically you see uh, the year over year, escalation at between two and a half to three and a half percent. So let's say it's about three, three and a half percent. But with COVID and all of the things that followed as a result of that, all of a sudden we had 12% and then we had 20% escalation and it kept going. And right now um, we're being told that for the next two years, plan on another 5% each year. And so, um, it's it's not that this isn't an efficient design or a reasonable design. Um, if we go back and look at historical information at the Mass School Building Authority, you'll see that Castle Booz has been designing schools right in the middle. They're not on the high end, they're not on the low end, and this is how we price our projects. You you want something, you want something in the middle that's durable, good design. That, that you you can enjoy that as a community. But what has happened is just with the last three years, it just really has gone sideways. And if you had asked pre-COVID, if I thought I'd ever see a school at the levels we're seeing in the last year or two, I would have said, no, no, historically, I mean, anything can happen in the world, but historically that has not been the case. So this is an anomaly. We're in a different time, and it's and it's uncharted water. That's very yeah. helpful. And I'm reminded we had some of this conversation at at last meeting. So it's effectively a function of the escalation that you're budgeting in. Uh, when I think I'm going by memory from last meeting, but I think that aggregate was something like thirteen percent for an escalation. When you think about it differently terms of 5% a year, and we're two years out in terms of starting, and then your escalations assume kind of a midpoint of the, uh, of the period of construction, it becomes to make a lot more sense to me. And I shared with you and the committee some of my philosophy, and it's nothing more than crystal ball philosophy on the matter. But I'm a little bit of Pollyanna. I have this conversation uh, daily. I had it a few hours ago with a customer. Uh, I tend to think we're at a plateau point. Uh, so it, it, to plan for a continuation of a historic trend, or at least a little bit of a deceleration, I, I'm sorry, of a prior two to three year trend, I should say, uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, kind of be pleasantly surprised that it comes in under budget, my words, not anybody else's. Uh, I think conservatism might play well. It might play not so well in votes among uh, uh, town members to see numbers like this, uh, but I, I think it's prudent, just my two cents. So thank I you mean, for the education, if it's I very could, clear. If I could speak real quick um, to build on what Mariana just stated, um, a couple things and even um, what you said, Mr. Yez, you um is 
what we saw with COVID is we saw a 12 to 13 percent inflation yeah. um an escalation in one year um upwards of 20 in certain markets um and so when as Marianne said is we're looking at more leveling out when we say five percent because it was before then it was two to three percent for again it it changes but um we we had a significant spike um which everybody saw even in their eggs um is one thing the other thing to add in this standpoint is um to your question is yes the um difference between the base reimbursement rate and the effective is a very common thing across the commonwealth um and to that point um i think that we can revisit it um at our next building committee meeting as well to even for the public is um uh, because the msba is a public entity um a semi-public quasi-governmental agency is all the data for every school district's projects across the commonwealth are publicly available and so we we've done that in, in our tracking um even that you will be able to where you could see um what their base reimbursement rate is to what their effective reimbursement rate is and you'll even notice that trend how it changes at COVID because of just construction costs um so even with what's being presented here um tonight is nothing excessive um nothing um abnormal it, and and the data can show that just because as, as we've always said is they're there they they look to participate and and contribute but not pay for um and that goes to even questions um that came up as far as the ae fees um that you, you're looking at is what's reimbursable it's not um, and marianne was very thoughtful in in noting that our, our fees are typically well below the state percentage um in those things so um, I just wanted to kind of that that we will. I think it's it's it would be prudent to help everybody understand, even from the public, of the base reimbursement rate to effective across the Commonwealth. Marianne. Yes, I just wanted to say one thing because I, um, in my haste, I don't know if I answered your initial question, which was, is this typical, and are you seeing it? And the, it it is not unusual for us to see a reimbursement rate on eligible costs. And the effective rate being half or a little more than half of what was was there just to answer that question and and i can say that with personal experience across a number of projects and skanska's experience across some 20 odd projects and projects that we're seeing posted with the msba uh what what the cost data was so that it's not it's not unusual because because the base rate that you know you start with which was um 48 49 percent and then there was other incentive points that base rate is based on income poverty levels in the community as, as well and um the better a community is doing um the less their rate is and if if you have a city like Lowell or Brockton or Fall River, then their reimbursement rate would be higher, but their effective rate would still, you know, have the same kind of uh, ratio going on about uh, being less than than what you thought your initial reimbursement rate would be. Thank you, Ms. That's very helpful. Thank you very much. Sorry, Chair. Uh, uh, sorry, no, I'm, I apologize, Mr. Yesway. I stepped on you when uh, you were concluding your comments. Um, Mr. Echo, Mr. Buck, I'm going to first recognize uh, Superintendent Downing, and then I'm going to come back to Mr. Echo and get to Mr. Buck. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate it. Um, I just want to use this moment to remind the committee that what the vote is, is for submission on a budget to the MSBA. And I'm thinking back to Mr. Sikansky's question earlier, the vote to incur debt by the Neshoba Regional School Committee will be the number that we go to the voters with. So this number, uh, and I'll defer to Ms. Williams to clarify this for me, this number is not likely to be the exact same number that is the number to incur debt that this committee will vote upon uh, this summer prior to then going through our debt exclusion elections and town meetings. That's correct. Thank you, Superintendent Downing. Um, Mr. Eckel. So I'm new to the committee too, so for... I'm going to try really hard not to retread any ground. Um, 
So maybe I'll just ask the question in a yes or no format. So the narrative I heard is that our reimbursement rate is good, but construction's really expensive. And so that's making, even though our reimbursement's great, our effective rate looks poor because one's got higher than the other. And then the other part of the equation is that it sounds like, if I heard it right, that they're not reimbursing um, as many things. Is that right? That's that's correct. Okay. Um, Thank you. One answer. <laughs> one word. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Eckel. Uh, Mr. Buck. Hey, um, Mr. Olson mentioned, reminded me, I think you'd said this before and I had forgotten, that all of the comparable data, actually having the slides down is going to make this harder for me to ask my question. Uh, all of the comparable data for other projects is also available. And I was curious um, if you already have that as comparable so we can look at this, or if you could point me to a link, or if there's a database that's public somewhere and I just need to find it somehow so that Again, this is like, how are we communicating to members of the public? How are we evaluating whether any of these numbers make sense, right? Is what the breakdown relative to other projects is, you know, percentage of administration versus percentage of construction as a, as a percentage of the total project mm -hmm. cost. Like it's in isolation without comparables. It's hard to know whether any of these numbers are good numbers or bad numbers. Um, and I'm not sure where to look for some of the comp information besides like, the Lincoln Middle School website. Um, Let me unmute you. Yeah, I'm looking for like a like a. So big what, what I'm going to do is numbers, this is the know? MSBA website for that, and what we'll do is we'll put a link. In, I'll I'll put the link in the actual chat for people as well. But when you go in here, you'll be the capital planning cost data in the building with us. So if you click in here. Here's where you could see the designer and OPM fees, a schematic design, estimated in total project cost, that schematic design. That's and again, as I mentioned, so this is current data and historical data. So each one of these, so if we clicked on this, as we pick on high schools, because that's relevant, is you'll see all high schools from October 2012 as of April 2023 ah, information. Got it. Going this is great. Thank you. Back Greg. and so the, you'll see right all direction. of them going through. And these are projects that have gone through that are have completed schematic design. So um, as we look at some of the ones on the last page, for instance, are ones that are post COVID when you look at those numbers. So what I'm going to do okay. is back myself out and I'm going to put this link in the chat for people. Um, and I will send that to. Um, everybody. There was also Great. a slide, Thanks, Craig. Craig. There was also a slide, Craig, in one of the previous presentations, right, that showed yes. the uh, uh, effective rate versus the uh, original reimbursement rate for different schools and recent uh, uh, construction projects, right? So if, we, if uh, Chris, if you go back and look at some of the uh, previous um, presentations, yeah, the, the, the that, that slide will, will be there. Yeah. Sense. We've yeah. gone over it a bunch. It's more like should construction be 60% of the total project or 80% of the total project? Like it's that, but Craig, you pointed me in the in the exact right place. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Buck. All right, I see a couple of old hands. I believe Mr. Eckel, Superintendent Downing, do you have anything further to add or uh, are those just old hands? Look like they're just old hands. Okay. Old hands for me. Thank you, Superintendent Downing. Um, I'm gonna quickly scan through. Does anybody else have any questions at this time? If not, I am going to um, call for a vote. Uh, before I do, <clears throat> um, first of all, I will ask Ms. Nguyen, are you ready, C, with the tally sheet? You are, thank you. Um, in the past, when we have um, essentially taken these crucial or touchstone votes, um, I've always asked as more of a symbolic gesture for our advisory members to also vote. So um, just for those who are here who have not uh, seen us go through one of these uh, types of votes before, um, we did this with the um, schematic design. Uh, it's just a symbolic gesture. We'll keep it as part of our internal minutes. These will not be submitted to the MSBA, but I am gonna ask our advisory members to kindly vote on this motion as well. 
So um, seeing no further questions, and Ms. Wynn has told me she is ready, I am going to call the member roll, and I'll start with uh, Ms. Viverito. Yes. Ms. Cohen. Yes. Ms. Bailey. Yes. Mr. Buck. Yes. Mr. Zakansky. Yes. Superintendent Downing. Yes. Ms. Dupuy. Yes. Ms. Early. Yes. Mr. Eckel. Yes. Mr. Fromer. Yes. Ms. Kendall. Yes. Mr. Nicholson. Yes. Ms. Rich. Yes. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, Mr. Yesway. Yay. You got it. Thank you. Myself, yes. Um, Assistant Superintendent Friend. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Boynton. Yes. Mr. Frieswick. Yes. And last but not least, Mr. Mulcairn. Yes. Thank you. It's unanimous. Um, before we get to the adjournment, I do want to apologize to um, my fellow district committee members and my one district committee elect representative who are here tonight. Uh, this ran a little bit longer, a lot longer than we expected. So I apologize and I appreciate all of your patience and I thank you for that. Um, so last order of business is a motion to adjourn this meeting. So I will be happy to accept a motion in that regard. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Sikansky. Who seconded that? Uh, yes, wait. Mr. Yes, wait. Thank you very much. All right. Um, Mr. Yes, wait. Yes. Ms. Rich. Yes. Mr. Nicholson. Yes. Ms. Kendall. Yes. Mr. Fromer. Yes. Mr. Eckel. Yes, sir. Ms. Early. Yes. Ms. Dupuy. Yes. Mr. Sikansky. Yes. Mr. Buck. Yes. Ms. Bailey. Yes. Ms. Cohen. Yes. Ms. Viverito. Yes. Superintendent Downing. Yes. And myself, yes. Thank you all very much. We are adjourned. Turn the meeting over to Ms. Viverito. Thanks so much, Joe. Uh, despite the meeting running long, you did a great job. So thank you. Thank you. All right. So uh, we are going to, I just want to make sure that um, Nikki is still with us. Yep. Bolton Access is here. So everybody, uh, it is at 7.40 p.m. that I will open up the uh, meeting of the Neshoba Regional School Committee. and. Um, we will move right to discussion um, on the moving on the recommendation of the NRHS School Building Committee regarding the approval of the project scope and budget. And so, um, Mike, are you present and ready with a motion for us? Sorry, guys, I'm moving through. I'm sorry, can you hear me okay? Hey, you are. Hi, Mike. Yes, thank you. Hi there, I'm sorry about that. Um, I, uh, unfortunately, I am not, I'm not prepared for a motion, actually. Oh, that's okay. Um, that's totally fine. I Leah, can do you, actually- Leah, do you want me to read the motion? Uh, that that so. would be great if you have it there. I, sure. I have it right here. At least I apologize for that. Oh, Sorry. no, that's no apology necessary, Mr. Horsch. All right, um, I will move to approve and adopt the Neshoba Regional High School Building Committee's recommended schematic design project budget in the total amount of $241,714,926 and to further adopt and approve the recommendation of the Neshoba Regional High School Building Committee to direct Skanska USA, the owner's project manager, to include and or submit the schematic design project budget as adopted and approved to the Massachusetts School Building Authority on behalf of the Neshoba Regional School District no later than June 27th, 2023. I'll second that. 
So um, for those of you who were not privy to the um, presentation at the last or the entire presentation at the last meeting, um, we can certainly open it up for discussion, make sure that everybody has all the information that they need to uh, um, vote on this recommendation from the school building committee. So just throw up your golden hand if you have any questions. I see Shondor, go right ahead. Um, so during the earlier uh, presentation, it was explained that if the costs increased, none of that would be eligible for reimbursement. And so that's why it was uh, prudent to be conservative to the approach around the budget. Um, I wasn't clear if um, the budget decreases in reality, how that works with the effective reimbursement rate. Go right ahead, Marian. Okay, uh, that's a great question. What, what happens is we build in contingencies for escalation and design contingency. And, and as we move further through each iteration of design, we're moving those dollars that were carried as escalation to a certain point in time, we start to roll that money up into the sub-trade costs. So what we're doing is we're, we're not trying to have an excessive number, we're trying to have a responsible number so that when you, you, you want to be able to literally take the money to the bank. And so this is built on many levels of accounting for those different types of contingencies. Uh, my question was the other way is what if uh, we end up spending a lot less than this? What happens with then, that as it relates to the reimbursement? From that? Once, once the project is uh, fully designed and then we're able to establish a GMP, which is a guaranteed maximum price. We send that information to the Mass School Building Authority and it's called a, a project funding bid amendment. So once we have all the bids in and we've done the descoping, we'll know where we are with that number. Thank you. Uh, Joe, did you wanna to add to that? Uh, yeah, just to further clarify, um, when uh, we have uh, contingencies for escalation and for design contingencies, it's really intended to accommodate for uh, refinement in the design. As we know, we're only in schematic phase now, and there are a lot of things that are described and, and not really detailed or fully specified. So that's meant to, to accommodate uh, further refinement of the design, but it's not intended to accommodate large changes in scope and uh, a large change in scope between one mechanical system and the other would probably be something that would have to go through the MSBA and would be ineligible. Um, secondarily, if uh, we do reduce the scope um, uh, or we do reduce the cost significantly, Marion, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe that the, the effective rate is also uh, adjusted to reduce it by that amount of money. So uh, half right, Joe, yes, if it's, if it's reduced by eligible costs, then that, that would influence the cost one way. If it's reduced by ineligible costs, then, then it's to the better of the reimbursement. But it's all based on, on, on the square footage, which is part of that over. So over. for example, if, if the cost per square foot came down, the effective reimbursement, since, since they're only reimbursing us for a portion of the total of, of, of per square foot cost, if that came down, our effective rate would go up because they're not covering the cost anyway. Correct. Okay. I think I have a question too that's kind of related to this. And so if we incur, if we incur debt, we go to the towns, we ask them for X amount of dollars, but we don't end up spending that amount of money. Um, how does that work? 
I think this is, goes, this is for I, Ross or Kirk. I don't know. Yes. Um, ultimately, what happens at the end of the project is, uh, depending on what our bond strategy is, at the conclusion of the project, we bond what we expended. So if what we expended is below what was approved with incurring debt, we would just bond what we, because then it's, it's added on to the annual assessments. And when you speak to that strategy, Kirk, this is something we'll talk about much later, but um, you're talking about maybe going out for multiple rounds of bonding. And so the last round would perhaps be lessened. Yeah. So that's a potential method. Uh, we would have to hear from bond council on that strategy and, and our advisors, but that, that is a method that is utilized um, in building projects. Thank you. Any other questions? on the recommendation. Seeing none, we'll go to uh, take the vote. Uh, Shondor. Yes. Joe. Yes. Sharon. Yes. Mike. Yes. Amy Cohen. Yes. Amy Vessels. Yes. Scott. Yes. Maureen. Yes. Karen. Yes. Myself. Yes. Unless I already voted. Can't remember. Did I get everybody? I think I did. Thanks, Alita. All right, everybody. So the vote is unanimous. We have um, approved the recommendation of the school building committee, and we really do appreciate your time here. Joe, great job getting us to this stage of the process. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I am ready if there's no other matters to be discussed. Uh, there's nothing on the agenda. Take uh, a motion to adjourn. So move, Madam Chair. Thanks, I'll second Joe. that. Thanks, Amy. Mm -hmm. All right, one more time for the vote. Shondor. Yes. Sharon. Yes. Um, let's go Maureen. Yes. Karen. Yes. Myself. Yes. Scott. Yes. Amy Vessels. Yes. Amy Cohen. Yes. Mike. Yes. And I feel like I did miss someone. You missed me. I spoke. Yo! Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what say you, Joe? I thought yes. Thank you, sir. All right, everybody. Thank you to the design team for um, being here and to the entire, uh, both of the committees. We appreciate your time. Yeah, I thank, thank you as well from the chair of the, the building committee. And I especially want to, I always take an opportunity to always thank Ms. Winch. She is my right-hand person. I couldn't do anything without you. Thank you very much, C, for everything you do. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.